Well, good morning and uh, welcome to this video. <laughs> the only video you've ever actually seen, despite that your mind will tell you that you have memories of other videos that you've seen in the past or uh, videos that you might want to see in the future. This is the only one there is because this moment is the only moment there is. And that's the mindset that you are being encouraged to adopt and to work towards as a constancy of your association um, through the workbook lessons of A Course in Miracles and the text, of course, um, to bring you into a present state and a conscious state within your own framework so that you can begin to recognise the inner and outer worlds as being not only the same, although the external is symbolic of the internal state, not world, there is no actual world. Your, uh, your state of mind depicts what it is that's uh, going to be your reference. And also so that you can learn to bring the here and now into your meditative purposefulness <laughs> um, to enter into the stillness of what the meditative here and now is and push beyond the limit or go through the clouds, as Jesus says in um, A Course in Miracles, go through the clouds of consciousness or the veil, push through the mist um, into the light, which is very easy to do and very natural to do um, once you can stop trying to work out what you're actually meant to be doing and just do it. Uh, however, there is a, um, what would you call it, a counter curriculum through, uh, and we'll call it the universal curriculum that you will need to adopt as an idea of the purification process to help free your mind from the burden of the cause and effect relationship propaganda that you've taken on for yourself since you find yourself in this experience of a world. But, uh, and I just want to add in there also that your experience of separation from source, the idea that you believe in that seems to maintain the, the physical nature of things. And when I say you, I've got to keep my finger here on my nose. <laughs> um, that experience began or that idea began as potential long before the world was made for the place uh, to come and play out the, the resurrection and play out the um, looking at the idea and the witnessing to the changes in looking at the idea through the application of uh, the resurrection idea, which of course is forgiveness prior to which, prior to which Jesus came to bring forgiveness to mankind, there was only an eye for an eye, which perpetuated separation, didn't heal it. And... Uh, the idea of then any thought system, any thoughts, any ideas separate from I that um, hold value, hold meaning in my thought system are going to perpetuate the nature of my belief in the external reality, which for me is now dropping away at an alarming rate, not a, not alarming in a bad way, but alarming in, in an exciting way. <laughs> uh, I'm very much in the world, but not of it, uh, other than when I seem to be making these videos, which perhaps I can apply forgiveness to that. And maybe I won't make any more videos, but people keep asking to make videos. So um, if your brother asks, you just say yes, you know, because why would you care what you're asked to do or not asked to do if you really truly knew that everything was the will of God and uh, if you truly knew this was just a dream it wouldn't worry you one way or the other um, the caveat to that of course is that why would you react at all to anything in a dream if you truly knew you were dreaming and uh, that has more to do with um, cherishing the defense mechanisms of the temporal identity or the false identity rather than uh, what you react to out in the world because what you react to out in the world is always going to change. It's always going to be on a changing landscape, a changing visual. And uh, until you understand that everything out there is all the same, until I understand that everything out there is all the same, um, 
it's like a kaleidoscope. It's the same beads at the end of the tunnel, but just the mind is twisting it. And I think that it's something else, but it's not. It's the same thing, really. <clears throat> so it's all the same. Everything out there is all the same. It all represents death. It all represents separation. It all rep represents that belief. And the only thing, the only um, moment wherein I'm aware that it's not life is in the illumination of the mind, in, in enlightenment, salvation, nirvana, whatever you want to call it, where the mind is transcended through that meditative and prayerful practice. Um, sometimes it happens spontaneously. Um, and you are awake in eternity where you have always been and only ever have been awake in eternity um, with part of the mind believing in what this appears to be. <laughs> but when you find yourself back here within the framework of this world like I do um, and like many others now do, um, you have a new reference point for what real is in your mind. It's like, oh, hang on, I experienced reality as formless and just pure light and can't really talk about it, but I wish I could. <laughs> There's no words in the language. Um, I experienced reality as that, therefore this is not that. This can't be reality because reality is endless and formless and never changes and it's eternal and it's all-encompassing. And this is the experience I find myself in the world with this avatar um, is uh, temporary and ever-changing and physical and solid. It seems to be physical and solid. Um, scientifically, of course, it's just atoms and, and you know, neutrons and whatever, and, and light passes through the body and everything all the time. It's, it's not really solid at all. 99.995% space or something. And... Uh, the other point five is uh, the tiny mad idea that it actually exists. <laughs> and of course, everything being an idea, it doesn't actually exist at all as a solid. It's quite funny. And then the questions come up. Well, how, how, how come I seem to experience it that way? And it's like, well, the power of the mind is very strong. You're using the power of God mind creating to miscreate. So therefore, you can convince yourself of anything. And uh, just on a very simple level... Um, if you're at about my age, you probably have had experiences and through the body, that is. You probably have had experiences of um, remembering things from your childhood that weren't at all the way you thought they were. <laughs> and uh, being completely s stunned by that, despite the fact that you've believed that they were that way resolutely, like just that's how they were. That, and that's... You know, it's like, nope, <laughs> I've been kidding myself all this time. Well, welcome to the big picture. I've been kidding myself all this time. Um, so in this video, um, I want to talk about the holy instant. Somebody asked me to talk about that, if I could do a video about that. Um, I want to talk about being healed from cancer, which apparently I don't have a dedicated video about. I've mentioned it in a few other videos, but... I think I'll do a dedicated video on that one. So in this one, I'll just talk about um, the holy instant. But first, I, I did have a query from someone who has, like many people, like most people, like myself included, has felt the need to be alone for an extended period in their spiritual progress, in their spiritual purposefulness. Don't know even that, if that's a word, but... Um, and I, I relate to that. There was a time in my life where I had to get out of society. I had to get away from the rat race and go and live as far from that lifestyle as possible, like talking growing organic and native foods and doing my own chickens and uh, interacting with other people in the same sort of way, living off the land and getting back to just the very um, organic kind of good lifestyle that is uh, no frills you know no airs and graces no rules no none of that i just had to purely fall back into existence mode or into subsistence mode i don't know what you would call that but and i know many people that do the same many many and uh, some people go off and uh, live on communes and i did that for a little while too uh, and uh, start communes if you want to start one that's great 
Um, but eventually comes the time when you feel like you've accomplished what you needed to accomplish by living alone and you want to be around more like-minded people because inevitably that living alone brings you into a greater context of the calamity of your own internal world and the chaos of your own internal world as it did with me I started to realize in my aloneness um, listening only to the chatter in my head how absolutely bonkers I was <laughs> I didn't realize simply that the answer was just stop listening to the chatter in your head and it'll fade away but um, you know and even with the course in miracles it took quite considerable mind training to be able to achieve even a small period of time where that was possible but Nowadays, of course, if I'm not talking, it's uh, pretty much quiet as a mouse in there. Um, so in the idea then, and this is the question that was presented or the, or, the, or the query that was presented, this person is feeling like connecting with others who are on this spiritual journey. So my advice is this. Stay where you are in your aloneness for a moment. And just do a little bit of exploring, reaching out. You'll find if you go to um, community halls, events, community events and things like that, try to be open and talk to people, stall holders. Um, new Age stores are good. If you talk to the owners of New Age stalls, they often have it. They're often a huge resource for community hub kind of involvement. Uh, on that level, especially um, like New Age and spiritual bookstores. And they should be able to connect you up with groups, like-minded groups, and offer you some sort of contact. And generally, you'll find it goes from there. All you need to do really is take the first step. If you're waiting for it to come to you, then um, maybe it will. But um, I always find if you take a leap of faith, take that first step first and just make some simple inquiries, um, you'll find that you are generally rewarded uh, fairly readily. Um, especially um, where I was living for my own circumstance, it was quite out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but I found to my happy surprise when it was time that I realised I wanted to be around more people and slowly let down my guard against what I thought I needed to be alone for, um, that people just started to show up. You know, I, I met somebody in the hardware store. I was buying some polypropylene pipe for my uh, uh, garden to run water down to my garden. And I met somebody else who looked a lot like me, who was asking me, uh, is that for a garden? And we got talking there and I ended up going to visit his garden and, and we gave each other gardening tips and different things. And then we ended up doing this commune thing together and there was about eight of us eventually. And um, things just sort of grew. So as far as A Course in Miracles goes, um, there is a huge online community. Um, if you go to my Dave Fair, P-H-A-R-E um, Facebook page, um, you'll notice that the people that comment on my, uh, there's not a lot, but sometimes I get a few, and the people that like my posts, add them as friends, right? Add them as friends because pretty much everybody that likes my stuff is on that sort of journey. And you can reach out to them and find people in your area. The other thing that um, I always advocate this is, just in the local newspaper or the local community pages online, things like that. Just put expressions of interest for a community group to start doing maybe twice a week reading A Course in Miracles, something like that, and see if you get anybody else. You usually find there's somebody in the neck of the woods, wherever you are, that's either read it long ago or they want to get into it or get back into it or uh, and do some more study and that sort of thing. And uh, it's different for everybody. I've been to Course in Miracles group meetings. I've been invited to meetings uh, around my country here in Australia, in Sydney, <laughs> where the meeting was run by a self-proclaimed witch, white witch, and there was tarot cards and crystals, and it's like that has nothing at all whatsoever to do with the study of a 
universal curriculum, although it may be one of the stepping stones that leads you into it, you know, as a concerted effort. And uh, and then I've been to another Course in Miracles group meeting up in uh, Atherton Tablelands where the people seem to be more interested in smoking weed and, uh, you know, having a party, than, uh, which is cool, if that's what you're into, than uh, helping each other with the principles, concepts, etc. embodied in the Course. Most people who get together to study A Course in Miracles actually like to open the book, read some stuff, and usually have a little bit of a chit chat about what they've read and maybe uh, apply, do some application of the lessons, you know, for whatever the, the day of the year. There's a little bit of structure in most meetings that I've been to, but some of them can be like, oh, that's interesting. Um, no, I don't think I'll drink what's in my cup, thanks. But, you know, you've got to be aware that spirituality attracts the wacky, right? Like and at one point in my time, I'm telling you, I was the wacky. I was I was out there. I was totally out there. I had beliefs, and I I kind of stuck to the the core. This is for my own self. I I kind of realised there was a central core to all religions and all spiritual beliefs about oneness and unity and all of that. And I kind of gravitated to that. I felt lucky that I did, you know. But uh, I know there's a lot, a whole bunch of weird things that. Go on. And I call it weird, but I mean, I don't know what it takes for anyone else to eventually get to the point of doing this. But if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. I uh, I did have a good look at tarot cards years and years ago because uh, I came across a book and it was about the esoteric arts. And uh, I used to like to look at books and look at all things and, uh, you know, before dismissing them, give them a good go. And there was a little bit about tarot and the magus john d and things like that and uh, i very much did have a gravitation towards a few of the things in that book and it sort of put me on a side track and i realized that in my mind it's like this isn't this is interesting but it's really like it seems to you know it's more stuff i don't know about and what it was that i was interested in was figuring out what it is that i don't know about right and ultimately in the end it's what you don't know that you don't know that stops you from progress so having a very good grounding in your heart space in your following your heart and just being true to that staying true to that i mean if something's interesting obviously the ego is going to always say oh that's cool i can make that into some sort of an identity or uh, some sort of thing but um Watch me tell people how much I know about tarot cards or, you know, watch me help people with foretelling their futures or their stories of the deceased and, you know, all of it. and it's just a bit, there's a whole merry-go-round of spiritual goop. That's what I call it. It's sticky. It kind of sticks to you. And when finally you do get to a true liberating opportunity, you find that you have to divest yourself of all that stuff anyway. You can't bring your identity with you and even all the accoutrements of your identity. So don't move from where you are. If you're living alone in the country as I was, don't move from where you are. Do a little bit of reaching out first right? and just feel the waters, feel it out. I mean, you I've, looking back, it's like, oh man, I could have stayed in my little house in the hills, which was beautiful. You know, I'd have, I would have loved to have been there today, I guess. But, um, and that's an idea of free will, I know, which is nonsense. But um, had I stayed there, I could have done the same thing, reaching out. There would, however, have come the point where I had to commit to um, being at the healing centre in Byron Bay, as that was what was presented to me, all or nothing. So, you know. Eventually, I would have had to leave there, but there was a lot of activities and things that I got involved in, which now looking back, it's like if I had have just sort of sat back a little minute and just looked at it and asked myself honestly how I truly feel about it rather than just allow myself to fall into it because I was tired of being alone, then I probably could have saved myself a fair bit of time uh, and uh, effort Um in getting to the crux of the matter but you never know you get something out of everything and uh, maybe everything i'm saying to you now is just like no i'm not going to stay here i need to get out you know, but just you know let yourself be guided 
That's what I'm really trying to say. Let yourself be guided by the heart. And uh, if you fall into prayer and ask for direction, I'm sure absolutely positive if it's honest prayer, something will show up to direct you. Like many people say to me, oh, I was praying for uh, some sort of sense in my life and then I found your videos and uh, came to one of your workshops and that sort of thing. And that's pretty common. I get that all the time. You know, and that's uh, prayer works. You know, you've got to use your, oh, top of my crown's really... <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Prayer works and uh, with everything you're learning, you know, like through the whole curriculum, the universal curriculum, you're learning to listen to your own internal guidance. You're learning to listen to the voice for the Holy Spirit within you. And uh, something like this video, something like me, should only ever really be a temporary expedient along the road to that where you finally pluck up the courage and the faith to actually say, right, I'm done with books, I'm done with videos, I'm done with Dave, I'm done with everything. I'm going to walk my path. I'm going to just be about it. And then uh, to that end, as a teacher, let's say, of this, um, it is my only purpose is to make myself redundant to you. I mean, I've got 500 nearly videos, I think, now. So <laughs> if, if you don't, if you don't find some kind of uh, clear direction in those videos, I mean, you know, I tell people if you've been studying spirituality for more than 12 months and you haven't had some kind of experience, uh, maybe put your books and your, and your accoutrements down and just go take a holiday for a while, do something else and let something else happen that's not of your own structure, not of your own making. Um, so the holy instant. Hmm. <laughs> <sighs> There's the holy instant. When I let go of all my defences and enter into a moment of perfection and uh, become glad. The holy instant, let's talk about it physically first. I mean, ultimately, everything here is an action of mind. And we're talking about with the holy instant, we're talking about that little in the mind where um, I refuse to adjust to my anxiety, my stress, my disorder, my pain, my whatever it is. And I allow myself to fall prayerfully into a moment of surrender where something else can happen for me through that prayerful, through that open-minded prayerful um, application that doesn't come from my own thinking. Something else can happen for me that isn't of my own making. Right? Leaving a gap in my rhetoric, leaving a gap in my uh, expectations, in my um, habitual responses, all that sort of thing. So if you had, let's say, an example of, and all examples are egotistic, I know, but if you had an example of um, two people who know each other very well, let's say, and uh, they're friends and all of that sort of thing, avatar to avatar, and every day, hi, how are you? Isn't it lovely weather? The same old... <laughs> The same old nothing that people like to talk about. And you don't respond. You refuse to respond. There's going to come a moment, a moment left open where that response that you were expected to put in or you thought you should put in, that response you should reply with, um, doesn't come forth from your lips, doesn't come forth from your expression in any way. And you're not being aggressive or uh, assertive or anything like that. You're just waiting right, for some other kind of thing to happen in that moment, which is a cycle. It's a repetitive cycle. And this is where the holy instant comes in, in the moment where you recognize your cycles uh, or in any moment that you choose, actually. But it's more easily recognized in cycles where you can see the same thing playing out in your life again and again, maybe in a different way, but again and again. Same shit, different day. And uh, all of a sudden you refuse to put your input there and there becomes this moment. 
and you step back and the moment starts to expand and become uncomfortable like a pregnant pause, let's say, and, and there's this anxiety arises. Right? I've got to say something. I feel like an idiot. It's my turn to say something. Right? But that angst that's coming up, all anxiety is existential. The ego likes to break it down and compartmentalize it as I'm anxious because of this situation or that person or that event or whatever. It's not. That's just the way the mind corrupts the call to awaken, right? And presents it to you as an externally um, occurring possibility or potential or um, source. There is no source of you outside of anything of you outside. You're only ever reacting to your own thoughts, right? So um, when you have that moment, that empty moment, and you refuse to fill it in, that anxiety comes up. Well, that moment was always for that anxiety to come up. Every moment is for that, for to bring up that existential anxiety and not to adjust to it, to allow it to come up fully as the tip of an iceberg that encompasses the entirety of the idea of separation. Right? You may only experience a little tip of it in that particular situation, and it's like, I feel... I feel anxious or whatever, and the other person might then continue, are you okay, you know, or uh, whatever, and the moment will have passed. But you've got to get in touch with that anxiety that the ego does its very best to keep subdued. Right? You've got to see it, you've got to feel it. And with a little practice in that moment, realising what the moment is actually for, what that relationship and all relationships are for this, Realising what these relationships are actually for, you can bring about a shift in your consciousness through being um, willing to refuse to adjust to that anxiety and to allow it to consume you, to allow it to overpower you, overcome you. And nobody likes that. But remember, this is a journey into fear, not away from it. This is a journey to confront the limiting beliefs, the limiting ideas and the idea of limitation in its entirety that the human journey represents. So I find myself in a moment where I'm experiencing anxiety and I breathe and I offer it to the Holy Spirit, take this from me. I would have peace instead of this. Right? Don't be concerned about what seems to be needing to be played out on the external stage in that situation. It doesn't matter if that person walks away, if they never talk to you again or anything. Your salvation is the most important thing you're offering to your world. There's no such thing in salvation as the idea of friends or friendship. Everything is a one relationship, a singular universal relationship that I'm having with myself. There is no next door neighbour that I've known for a long time and we have the same conversation every day. There's an idea I have about myself that is attempting to validate my external reality as real in denial of the fact that my eternal reality that I experience in my um, salvation, in my enlightenment, is obviously real and this is not. <laughs> That brings you into the paradox. It's like, it seems to be real, but it's not real. There's a paradox there, right, which is why you need a miracle, because you can't get out of a paradox by examining it. There's no alternative. Like, it's a paradox because it's a paradox. And the reason that you need a miracle is because your ego can't corrupt a miracle. There's no definition for a miracle, and the ego works by definitions works by breaking everything down into little pigeonholes and little bits and telling you that this is what this is and this is what it does and this is what it's for and this is how you can use it and this is how you can manipulate it and this is how you can get more of it or, or lose it or whatever. But uh, the miracle, it's like, man, it's I'm taking my hands off the wheel. I need a miracle. I just need something else to occur, not of my own making. I don't even need to know what it is. I'll do anything for it. I'll, whatever my part in it has to be that I play out, I'm willing. I'm willing to go through whatever it takes. And for some people, that's a big bridge to cross. You know, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. But you have to reach that place in your mind. You have to be in that place where I will do anything, literally anything. I just need a miracle. You know, I'm willing to represent whatever, to do whatever, to go whatever. 
to be a servant, you know. Use me, Lord. I'm an instrument of your will from here on in. <laughs> and you'll find that your life just gets happier and happier. Um, initially, of course, in the transition, there's this flip-flopping where you sort of want to refer back to your old way of thinking about things and your old way of seeing things and uh, think that that's actually how you could get out of the situation you find yourself in. But, of course, it'll, it's just going to come around again. So the holy instant. When, and I'll, I'll couch it in a meditative sort of way, but when you surrender that anxiety, when, when you refuse to adjust to your pain, and all, all the world is pain, in case I forgot to mention that earlier, that meeting with two people talking about the world, that's pain, everything, right? The entire experience of humanity is pain. Buddha said life is pain. And Jesus said, uh, you know, the world is, this world is not your home. There's not anything here in the world that uh, is going to make you feel at home. And no matter how much you try to make yourself feel comfortable, there is still going to be this little niggling feeling that something's not quite right here or there's something you need to do and whatever, which is probably what's led you to this video. But uh, when you fall into that moment of surrender, I refuse to adjust, I refuse to perpetuate I refuse to read from my lines. Right? I refuse to I refuse to bow down to the world and read from the script that the world expects me to read from to con con to continue the perpetuation of the status quo, you know. Um I want to allow something else to happen, so divine. So you allow that prayerfulness for that anxiety when you're in touch with it and I would always tell you stay there for as long as you can. Dig into that anxiety as it comes up for as deep as you can go. <sighs> Breathe and just don't adjust to it. Let it come up and you'll be like, oh, I feel terrible. I feel terrible. I've got to, I've got to get out of here or, uh, you know, until finally you realize that that doesn't work. Um, when, and this is in a meditative reference, when you're meditating, when you're doing that in meditation with your eyes closed, in the moment where that all gets flipped over, where it's taken by your higher mind, by the, by the spirit of wholeness, the Holy Spirit, um, and transformed into something lovable and useful and, and loving and all of that as an idea of self-love, as an idea of peace, inner peace and all of that, usually... I've got to say it for me anyway. For me, it comes with an experience of light, a flash of light, like in the cross to consciousness or in a peripheral conscious. Um, there's always some kind of reference that, um, you know, sometimes there's just a recognisable shift. Sometimes you just realise I've had a shift in my consciousness. I've offered up a 10-pound package of, uh, anxiety with my 10 pound prayer for help <laughs> doesn't do any good to offer a two pound prayer for a 10 pound problem right so um lip service gets you nowhere right so dig in feel it right feel it to heal it allow it to come up to the nth degree that you can and then offer it to the holy spirit all of this take it from my hands but you've got to own it you've got to take responsibility for it this is my denial this is my energy of uh, and I call it anxiety, but it's really the miscreative, energetic uh, poundage of uh, what it is I tried to steal from heaven, let's say. <laughs> you stole some you stole some chemicals from the laboratory and now you have to give them back because you've been doing nothing but miscreating these situations that you don't really like ever since. It's kind of funny. <clears throat> um you got to give them back. There's, there's, <laughs> there's no punishment. You didn't know what you were doing. You were an innocent child of the universe and we love you all, <laughs> all the more. We just want you to love yourself again. You're not guilty of anything in a dream all right? or or in, not in a dream or anything. Um, so allow, I guess, allow for the moment of refusal to participate in the dream 
to bring forth the holy instant within you to whatever nth degree that that possibly can occur. And you are the one who is the arbiter of that. You are the one who decides how deep you will allow yourself to go in prayer, in feeling the miscreative power of uh, denial within yourself in order to offer it up to the Holy Spirit for healing. Right? You've got to remember everything's just energy. When you start to see things as energy, um, it gets a lot easier You know, because you feel it. You feel energy. You don't really analyse it with your brain or with your mind. You know, the, the conscious part of your uh, experience here, you, you sort of feel it and it's like, oh man, this doesn't feel good automatically ego is going to be searching through the backlog of references for other things that don't feel good to try and offer you reasons why to keep you externalized and looking out there. You know, don't feel good because uh, I've had 10 of these meaningless conversations already today. It's like, no, it doesn't feel good because somewhere you know it's not, not relevant to the truth of your expression. You know, the truth of your expression is love. And that doesn't have to look a certain way, but it's just from the heart. It's a heartfelt kind of thing. It doesn't come from a place of, oh, I'm not talking about the weather again. <laughs> Unless you really like talking about the weather. <clears throat> oh, I've just got a pop-up that I've won a $100 wine voucher. <laughs> really? I won't adjust to that. <sighs> There's not, not really any energy in that. So, whatever. Um, so the holy instant, I mean, there's plenty of references for it in the Course in Miracles. Um, if you, people are telling me that Foundation for Inner Peace has run out of hard copy editions of A Course in Miracles. Also, the Borderland Foundation has run out of hard copies. You can put your name down for one there. They're given away for free at the Borderland Foundation. But if you have Kindle or, uh, you know, even on your phone, um, you'll find down below in the links here, down below, Tina will put the uh, link to the free PDF for the text and workbook of A Course in Miracles. And you can just start doing it on your phone or tablet. And uh, if you've got A Course in Miracles group you're working with. Oh, and here's an interesting thing just with regards to that. So the little book, I don't have one here, the little book that we give away for free, which we're very close to printing the next edition, Um and thank you to everyone contributing some coin for that. It's greatly appreciated. The more money we get up and from now until the time of printing, the more we're going to print. So there you go. If anyone wants to put in like five grand, we'll get uh, 10,000 books or something. I think we've got about two and a half grand now. Anyway, getting sidetracked. Um, Australian dollars, sidetracked again. Um, the little book. So that little book, the core of that little book that we give out is the reviews of the first 50 lessons of A Course in Miracles, which you'll find in the workbook after lesson 50. Um, those reviews, there's 50 of them. They're reviewing lesson one to 50. They're very short little, tiny little paragraph for each lesson, just a review. Um, if you're in a group, right, before you do anything in the group, read the entirety of those reviews, those first 50 reviews of the first 50 lessons. Don't read the whole 50 lessons, but at the back of the 50 lessons, there's the reviews, okay? Um, read those before you do anything else. It'll take you about 45 minutes, right? Breathe, try to consciously read them. Don't read them like you're sitting at a train platform waiting for a train and reading a magazine where it just goes in your eyes and off into La La Land, try to really connect, try to be conscious with it. Um, you'll find in a group setting, because where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them, that the Christ energy amongst the participants will be a lot stronger, a lot more unified, and you're sharing a purposeful activity together in the name of the greater good. Um, you'll find that you have an incredible... Um, Reaction. You'll find many people in your group will have incredible reactions to um, simply reading those lessons. Right? 
and then maybe go on and have a cup of tea or something and you know and then come back to a meditation try to form a little bit of structure in if you're setting up a course group or you're part of a course group remember you're the voice you don't have to sit there and allow other people to um which is really no other people it's the ideas in in your own mind project it out um you can stand up for yourself and say hey I don't want to smoke weed at the meetings. I don't want to uh, make it all about getting together for a chit chat and just leave the book on the coffee table. I want to actually use the book and, you know, and this is this is one of the things I've heard of that we can do and put a little bit of structure into these meetings for the discipline and the determination of uh, the participants and the, and the greater encouragement of actually working with the principles, you know, so... If somebody does have a reaction to um, reading those things, and I, every single time, every single time, and if you go to our um, early Zoom meetings, you'll see it, somebody in the group will have a reaction, some more than others. Don't try to stop them having a reaction. Don't try to make them stop crying or don't pat them on the back. Just leave them alone. Let them go through what they need to go through and realise that it's, it's a divine occurrence and don't try to bring them out of it. Let, let the whole thing as an organic kind of happening occur to its uh, natural conclusion <laughs> because it's going to happen to you, I guarantee. And when you start to have a release and inside you're going to be silently grateful for it, even though it may be somewhat embarrassing or humiliating in company or whatever, um, you won't want anyone to stop that happening because you've gone a whole life without releasing all that crap and it's time for it to come out and you know it. It's time for all that dark energy to be gone from you and uh, all that uh, misguided impulses and everything to be healed so that you can get back on track and get out of this third dimensional shithole and move on in the journey of the soul to the fifth, seventh, twelfth dimension and finally to the formless, uh, formless realm where we belong. <laughs> Unless you like it here and then, hey, there's more lifetimes ahead if you don't... Uh, if you don't change your uh, your purpose, but my purpose now is healing. It is forgiveness. It is love. It is being honest about where I find myself. Not trying to be spiritual and play at being spiritual and present myself in some kind of false light as a false prophet or anything. It's like I'm in this with you guys. I mean, I've found forgiveness and I'm applying it and I'm doing the work and I'm getting the result and I'm seeing it and it's beautiful and. Uh, uh, Yeah, that's probably it. All right, I love you. And um, I really enjoy your questions. I really enjoy it if you like and subscribe, which Tina asked me to ask you to do all the time and helps uh, boost our profile apparently on social media. And, uh, you know, the reason doing for that would only ever be to, for the sharing of the information because ideas are increased by sharing and we're sharing an idea of love through forgiveness instead of an eye for an eye. And... Uh, we are carrying the uh, the Saviour's message in our hearts and uh, love thy neighbour and love thyself and God as you would yourself, etc. <laughs> I'm a bit sloppy on uh, biblical quotations, but you get the idea. All right, peace.